So we'll continue our discussion about the NAC contraction mapping theorem today, and we'll talk about how different algorithms converge, why different algorithms converge. And the underlying reason is more likely than not Banach contraction mapping theorem. So T is a map from Rn to Rn. T satisfies Beta is in 0, 1. This implies xk plus 1 equals to dxk converges to x star. That's it. You can replace the Rn with any closed set. Uh, so t could be a function from a closed set to a closed set. The rest of the expression will still hold true. I'm using Rn because right now we are looking at Rn, but it could be used for on any closed set to any closed set. <coughs> okay, so that's Banach contraction mapping theorem. So let's talk about why this theorem is important. Uh, we'll start with the usual gradient descent method. So I want to minimize f of x. X is in Rn to draw a figure. This is my Rn, this is my star. And I define my T of x as x minus alpha gradient of fx. What is the gradient of T of x? I minus alpha second derivative of f x. Let's look at gradient of T at x star i minus alpha second derivative of f at x star. What do you think about this matrix? So I'm evaluating the second derivative at x star. What do you think about this matrix? In the case of unconstrained optimization, what was the sufficient condition? The sufficient condition was that the second derivative must be positive definite, right? So the necessary condition is that this needs to be positive semi-definite, but a sufficient condition is that this needs to be positive definite. What do we know about this kind of gradient descent? So if it is positive definite, then uh, the gradient descent method would converge to the optimal solution, which is x star. So in the case of uh, convex function, this gradient descent will converge to the optimal solution. So let's try to assume that the second derivative is positive definite. So this is, this is positive definite. So if it is positive definite, then I have lambda 1 all the way up to lambda n. All of these are greater than 0. And what I really want to do Remember in the previous lecture we were talking about this map and we said that beta is somehow related to the spectral radius of the matrix. If t was a linear function then it was related to the spectral radius of the matrix A. So let's try to, I'm going to connect everything in a bit but for the time being let's try to figure out what the spectral radius of this particular matrix is going to be. Any thoughts what the spectral radius of i minus alpha second derivative of f is? 
So these are the eigenvalues of and these are all strictly greater than 0. Let's for the sake of argument assume that this is arranged in an order such that lambda 1 is greater than equal to lambda 2 is greater than equal to blah blah blah. So what's the spectral radius of i minus, what's the eigenvalues of i minus alpha second derivative? Yeah. Right? So this is the smallest eigenvalue, this is the largest eigenvalue. How can I make all of this? So I want the spectral radius of this to be less than 1. So I want each of these values to be less than 1, absolute value to be less than 1. So I want absolute value of 1 minus alpha lambda n to be less than 1. I want 1 minus alpha lambda 1 to be less than 1. What should I do with alpha? What kind of alpha can I pick so that this holds true? Uh, okay, let's make it more concrete. So my lambda 1 equals to 5 and my lambda n is equal to 100. So if alpha is 1, this would become 99. Any other thoughts? One over lambda one. One over lambda n. So this would become zero. What would this become? Yeah, I think it's working, working out, right? One over lambda n. If we pick one over lambda n, then this is zero. And this is, this is less than 1. This is equal to 1 minus lambda 1 over lambda n. Okay, so alpha equals to 1 doesn't work. Alpha equals 1 over lambda n, this works. Any other thoughts? Any other number that comes to your mind? Let me try something experimental. I don't know whether it will work out or not. If I want this to hold true, so I want 1 minus alpha lambda n to be equal to negative of 1 minus alpha lambda 1. Because this is going to be, this is the smallest eigenvalue, this is the largest eigenvalue. I want the smallest eigenvalue to be negative of the largest eigenvalue, okay? What do I get? Minus 1 plus alpha lambda n equals to 1 minus alpha lambda 1. I get alpha lambda n minus plus lambda 1 equals to 2, 2 over lambda 1 plus lambda n. What happens at this angle? Am I getting am I getting these two values less than one? Let's let's check it out. So I get one minus two lambda n over lambda one plus lambda n. And then I get 1 minus 2, 1 minus, yeah, 2 lambda 1 over lambda 1 plus lambda n. Is this less than 1? Let's look at it. This is lambda 1 minus lambda n over lambda 1 plus lambda n. Yeah, I think this is less than 1. So this is going to be negative. No, this is positive. But uh, 
you're subtracting something from lambda n and then you're dividing it by the sum. Both of these are positive numbers. This is less than lambda 1, so this is strictly less than 1. So this is less than 1. And this is just negative of this, so this is also less than 1, it's absolute value. So this also seems to work. What about alpha very, very small? So alpha equals to epsilon. I'm taking a very small value. Would it be less than 1? So I'm subtracting a very small number from 1. So it's less than 1. I'm subtracting a small number from 1. It will be less than 1. Any value of, any small value of alpha, I'll make sure that it is less than 1. So basically, there is a range of alpha for which this matrix has eigenvalues spectral radius less than 1. So this also works. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's lambda 1. Lamb no. Right. Yeah, I think lambda n. Lambda n is correct because this is lambda 1 over lambda n. Oh, no, I think lambda 1 is correct because lambda n is smaller. So this lambda n over lambda 1, you're subtracting something smaller than 1, so it'll be less than 1. So this is correct. That's right. Thank you. So what I have is for alpha between 0 and alpha bar, my row of i minus alpha second derivative of fx star is less than 1. Alpha bar is the upper limit. Any questions so far on this? Yes. Of course. <laughs> because I want lambda 1 to be largest and lambda n to be smallest. No. No, it was. <laughs> okay. Lambda 1 should be 100 and lambda n should be 5. Okay. Any question? Any other question? No. Okay. So we all agree that for some values of alpha between 0 and alpha bar, this matrix will have spectral radius less than 1. Okay. I'm going to erase this side of the board. So here, my spectral radius, so, so I'm looking at the spectral radius of gradient of t at x star. Uh, so at this particular point, my spectral radius is less than 1. Now let me start moving out. What's going to happen? It turns out that the as I keep moving out, so I'm keeping the alpha fixed, but I'm moving away from x, x star. Okay. My spectral radius would still be less than 1 for a small ball. Okay, The small could be sufficiently large, but it won't be going all the way to infinity. Because the eigenvalues of a matrix is a continuous function of the entries of the matrix. Okay, So you perturb the entries of the matrix a little bit, the eigenvalue will get perturbed a little bit. So if I know that the eigenvalue is less than 1, at this point, and I move around a little bit, my eigenvalues will still be less than 1, or spectral radius will still be less than 1. So I have found a ball around x star where the spectral radius of gradient of t of x is less than 1. OK. Awesome. Now, let's look at 
t of x 1 minus t of x 2. So, I pick two points x 1 and x 2. And I look at t of x1 and t of x2, what do I get? Alpha is already used, beta is already used. What should I use? Delta is used, epsilon is used. Theta? Have we used theta yet? No. Great. This is equality by the way, there exists a theta that depends on x1 and x2. This is the usual mean value theorem. So for every x1 and x2, there exists a theta that depends on x1 and x2, so that t of x1 minus t of x2 satisfies this expression. So this is an n cross n matrix. This is your uh, difference, whatever. Okay, so here is the idea. I am going to take the norm on both sides, and I am going to take the two norm. And the reason why I am taking the two norm is because it is a symmetric matrix. Uh, because you know like if this matrix A is symmetric then it is 2 norm like you can pick 2 norm if this matrix A is not symmetric then you have to pick an appropriate norm yeah because this works for all norms in Rn so in this case we are just going to pick an appropriate norm for the appropriate matrix that I have here okay so I get this thing and where does that 1 minus theta x1 plus theta x2 lie? It somewhere lies within this ball, right? And what we have established is that the spectral radius is always less than 1. So let me call 1 minus delta, less than equal to 1 minus delta. So this is equal to 1 minus delta, which is my beta for this operator T. So what have we done? We have identified an operator and a value of alpha and a ball B around the point X star so that the Operator T is actually a contraction operator. What does that imply? If I start within the ball and I keep applying T again and again, I will get a sequence that's going to converge to X star because X star is the fixed point. If you look at it, T of X star equals to X star minus alpha times gradient of F at X star. What is the gradient of F at X star? It's equal to zero. That's the optimal solution. So all I get is x star. So t of x star is equal to x star. x star is the unique fixed point of this operator t. And so any sequence will converge to that unique fixed point. So any sequence will converge to x star. Yes? Uh, so delta is just a small number. So this is strictly less than 1, right? This is strictly less than 1. So I'm just calling it less than equal to 1 minus delta. Just a, just a number below 1, some number below 1. So every, if you look at the spectral radius of the gradient of t within this ball, it's less than or equal to 1 minus delta. Yes? Can you give some information about the operator t is 
Exactly. This is the gradient descent operator, x minus. So t of xk, xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha gradient of f at xk. But gradient descent with a constant step size. It's a constant step size, right? I'm not writing alpha k. I'm just writing alpha. So this is the gradient descent operator. What we have just proved is that the gradient descent operator is a contraction. And what do we know about gradient descent method? What have you seen so far in all your experiments? If you pick your alpha very large, it diverges. If you pick your alpha somewhat small, it converges to the optimal solution. And the reason why it converges to the optimal solution is because the operator, the gradient descent operator, is actually a contraction map. OK, so now we know. After, I don't know, 25 classes into the semester, now we know why gradient descent converges. OK? Yes? Yeah, so remember the, the alpha equals to 1 over lambda 1, or alpha equals to or oh, lambda n, right? No, lambda 1. And then 2 over lambda 1 plus lambda n. So if you don't know what lambda 1 and lambda n is, you kind of try out different values of alpha, and you see when this thing converges. Okay? Or if you're far away, if you're outside the ball, then you have to pick even smaller values of alpha so that you can get inside the ball, and then you pick an appropriate alpha, and then you converge to the optimal solution. Any other question? No? <coughs> Whenever, so those of you who are training neural networks for a living, I don't know how many of you are training neural networks for a living, but many people are uh, in today's world. So what you will see neural networks people do is they pick a high value of alpha when they are here, and then they, after every 10 steps or 20 steps or 100 steps, they'll keep reducing the value of alpha. And the reason is, as you are moving closer to x star, uh, if you look at the second derivative of the function, you might have smaller eigenvalues far away from x star, and you might have higher eigenvalues closer to x star. So as a result of which, you have to keep changing the value of alpha, because if you're far away, you can pick larger value of alpha, and you will still be a contraction. But you get into like a region, then you change the value of alpha. You make it a contraction map again, and then you keep reducing the value of alpha, and that's how you basically train neural networks. And for that matter, you train a lot of algorithms that way. Because you don't have a good estimate of eigenvalues far away, so you use a larger step size in order to get make sure that the map is a contraction, and then you keep changing the alpha to make sure that it remains a contraction at every point of time. Yeah? So you're saying uh, your point, the initial point is out of the ball. Yes. How can you make sure that the direction is? You do trial and error. You know what the benefit, like the most important thing that OpenAI has done is it has figured out what alpha works for training LLMs. <laughs> they spend millions of dollars trying to figure out what is the right alpha to train LLM, and after that everything thing just works out for the specific objective function. For, and they spent millions of dollars in figuring out f, and then they spent another millions of dollars for figuring out alpha. And now they are billionaires. <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. It can. So yeah. Beta may be increased. It will That's be right. So then your convergence is slower. So if beta is close to zero, your convergence is faster. If your beta is close to 1, then your convergence is slower. So you're far away. You're far away. You pick a very small value of alpha. Your alpha is equal to epsilon. Then your, then your ball might look like this. OK? So for alpha equals to epsilon. So everything is a contraction, but it's a contraction with a very high contraction coefficient. Beta is known as a contraction coefficient. Let me write it. Ideal contraction coefficient is 0. I want beta to be equal to 0. But of course, beta equals to 0 is not possible. 
but I can always adjust the value of alpha so that I'm always contracting. The, with the alpha scheduler you mentioned that only works for convex edge, right? That's right. Yeah, so not many fractions are convex. Awesome, very good question. That's right. So within this region, the function f is convex. So within this region, a value of alpha would make sure that it is a contraction. Out, outside of this region, the function is non-convex, right? So those are the places where you have to be a bit careful and you have to massage the problem quite a bit. You can use mirror descent, you can use like other techniques to convexify the function here. And once you convexify the function here, then you have a descent direction and you start descending all the way to the optimal solution. Or do you know that you're starting in a convex region? You are not, you don't. So that's why you come up with a lot of massaging techniques. So you're massaging the function around the point where you started. So we talked about uh, proximal methods that in one of the lectures, I think lecture 10 or whatever. So that's the way to convexify the function. So if you go back to look at that lecture, we are trying to convexify the function around the initial condition. So this is my x naught. I'm going to convexify the function around x naught and find a descent direction. And then I change the function at every point of time because I'm changing the convexification function at every point of time. Okay. Okay. So this explains why gradient descent converges. Uh, let's try to go back to the question of Lagrangian method. Much of my research, by the way, is about contraction mapping theorem. We've worked a lot on understanding the contraction mapping theorem, so that's my favorite topic to teach in this class. Okay, so I have xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha xk lambda k. What is my operator t of x and lambda? It's What is gradient of t of x and lambda? Let me do the following. Yeah, so this is identity minus alpha. I have to differentiate the first term with respect to x. So I get, then I have to differentiate this with respect to lambda. What do I get? Yeah, gradient of hx. And then I have to differentiate this with respect to x. No, yeah, and then I have to differentiate this with respect to uh, lambda, and then I get zero. So this is not a symmetric matrix, by the way, right? Because you have negative 
gradient transpose, but you have positive gradient here. So it's not a symmetric matrix. It's just a matrix. And it can potentially have complex roots, uh, complex uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so one of the things, one of the results in the paper, uh, in the book is that actually if this matrix is positive definite, then the real part of eigenvalue of this matrix is always going to be positive. Okay, so now I have the eigenvalue is Without the minus, I have a negative sign here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I change, so this is a positive sign here. So this is negative, negative here. So this becomes negative. Okay. So now, uh, what do I need to show? So, okay, so the fact is, uh, I want to call this matrix A at x and lambda. So the lambda of A of x star lambda star is equal to A plus IB. Let me use lambda I. Have we used A and B? No, we have not. Oh, no, lambda I. Uh, so, okay, so I is the complex number here. Lambda K. No, k is already used as iteration number. Lambda j, j is also a complex number. Lambda l. Okay. You know, 10 weeks into the class, it's very difficult to find appropriate notation. Anyways, can't help it. So the fact is that al, is strictly positive. So the spectral radius would be 1 minus alpha AL minus I alpha BL. So the absolute value is going to be 1 minus alpha AI square plus alpha BL square. and then square root. By the way, this is only true if this matrix second derivative of Lagrangian is positive definite. It's a very strong requirement, but for now, let's assume that it is positive definite. Could you write the dimensions of this spectrum? Ah, perfect. This is R n plus m cross n plus m. So there are n, this is n cross n, this is n cross m, this is m cross n, and this is m cross m. And this is n cross n. So now the thing that we need to remember, we need to figure out is can I pick a value of alpha so that this is all less than one? This is the spectral radius. Can I pick a value of alpha so that this is all less than one? Okay, remember I want uh, I want to show that the row of gradient of t of x is less than equal to 1 minus delta. So I need to pick a value of alpha so that this is less than 1. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that I have, I have only one eigenvalue. Like it is al plus ibl and al minus ibl. I just have one eigenvalue. Can I pick a value of alpha which is going to reduce, make it less than 1. Uh, 
uh, yeah, just like what we did for the previous example, we can come up with, I don't know, 1 over AL or something like that. And oh, I just mean like the way you've written it on the board. Is that a fraction or is that, is that 1 minus alpha AL over square root or is this? Uh, the square root is over. So this is, this is A plus IB or A minus IB. So what is the absolute value of a complex number? So it's real part square plus complex part square. So this is the real part square plus complex part square, and then you have to take a square root. Okay. That's just how you take the... It yeah. just looked like a fraction the way you wrote it. Oh, uh, no, yeah, no, it's not. It's not a fraction. There's an equality sign here. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll erase this part. Okay. Any thoughts? If I pick the value of alpha to be close to zero, what will happen? So this term will be less than one. This term will be less than one. If alpha is very, very small. And then I square it, so the numbers will be smaller. I add it up, and then I take the square root. So basically, by picking a value of alpha very, very small, close to zero, you can make this as small as not as small as you want, but you can make this less than one. So the result is, if greater than zero, gradient of hx, hx star, full rank, which basically means x star is regular, There exists an alpha bar such that for all alpha in zero alpha bar, T is a contraction around X star lambda star. I'm not writing the precise statement, so basically there exists a ball around x star lambda star so that t is a contraction in that particular ball. So that's the actual statement. But basically, that's what the result is. The most important result here is that the second derivative of Lagrangian has to be positive definite, which is a very strong requirement. Yes. So lambda alpha bar is what made that expression less than zero. Less, less than, than one. one. So any pick pick alpha less than alpha bar, this expression will be less than one for all L. Okay. That's what the result is. It's it requires a bit of derivation. It's not that obvious, but you can find such an alpha bar such that this is less than. You can do it in MATLAB, by the way. Just Come up with a bunch of complex numbers and try to figure out. As long as, as long as the real part of that complex number is greater than zero, and then you can find out what this alpha bar is going to look like. But you have done this, by the way. You have done this assignment not for this kind of matrix, but I've asked you to plot the spectral radius of matrix for various hyperparameters a couple of times in the assignment. That was all to figure out at what point the spectral radius is less than one. And that's the best hyperparameter. Like whenever the spectral radius is smallest, that's the best hyperparameter for alpha and beta and all the stuff that you're doing. You will get the best hyperparameter for that. Okay. It was also part of your assignment four. I think first question was about momentum method, and I was asking you to find out the hyperparameter for momentum method. That's how you find the best hyperparameter. Any other question? OK, so now the problem here is I want my second derivative of L to be positive definite for this particular algorithm to work. But you know that's not required for sufficient condition of op for optimality. So we need to 
figure out what happens when the second derivative is not positive definite. So here is what I'm going to do. What should I erase? Can I erase this part? Okay, so I'm going to minimize f of x plus c over 2 norm of hx square x is in Rn such that h of x is equal to 0. So in this case, my Lagrangian is actually the original augmented Lagrangian. And then the second derivative will be second derivative. As Seven C So this is not positive definite, but I can pick a C sufficiently large so that this whole thing becomes positive definite. There is a C bar such that this particular matrix is positive definite. That is when gradient of H of X star is full rank. Okay, so instead of solving the, this problem, the original problem, you will solve this problem and that will ensure that this particular matrix is positive definite, which will ensure that there is an alpha bar such that for alpha sufficiently small, T will be a contraction map around X star lambda star. But this T is constructed for this optimization problem. Okay. So these are neat tricks in optimization. So you have this constraint. So this term is actually not doing anything to the objective function. But when you don't, when you're not, when you're trying to solve the optimization problem, you want this thing to be positive definite. So just by adding this term, you make sure that the, the second derivative is positive definite and then you can apply this contraction map. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, that's just a way to build up the story. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, like for instance, if you are looking at uh, minimizing half of x1 square plus x2 square such that x1 equals to, or whatever, ax equals to b, then in that case, you know that the second derivative is going to be positive definite. So you don't have to go through this complicated process. But you can always use this algorithm by default. It doesn't matter. <coughs> Any other question? OK, perfect. So that ends our discussion on static optimization. Uh, there is no class on Friday. But next week, on Monday, we'll start working on dynamic optimization. So the homework for you guys like an additional homework to assignment five, is you have to go and look at the video. Has, has, have you guys seen the Tesla, not Tesla, SpaceX 
launch video or whatever, the launch thing coming back video. Yeah. So I want you to observe that video, like look at that video like 500 times until the next class. And then we will watch that video in the class and we'll try to figure out what is being optimized in that particular video. Okay, so it is a, an optimization problem. Whatever that thing is trying to do is an optimization problem. So we'll try to look at that optimization problem in the next class. And then we'll start our discussion on dynamic optimization. Okay, uh, thank you. You have 10 more extra minutes in your life now. <laughs>